As you all know, I have been filming the sunspots for over four years, and I've always wondered what they are and what causes them. Whilst filming the sunspots last year, and looking at the luminaries we call planets and their locations to each other on Stellarium, I noticed that the positions of the sunspots seem to correlate with the positions of the planets in the ether. The periodicity, nature and cause of sunspots has attracted scientific attention for centuries. Most early theories averred that they were of planetary origin. In particular, possible tidal effects were investigated not only in the past but up to the present day. Voigt, for example, showed how the combined influences of Neptune, Uranus, Saturn and Jupiter could give a close resemblance to the sunspot curve from 1749 to 1928. While Bollinger constructed a chart showing a consistent relation between the 11-year sunspot cycle and a similar cycle found by the 0 degrees, 45 degrees, 90 degrees configurations of Jupiter, Venus and Earth for the period 1749 to 1955, but not all theorists assumed that gravitational forces were responsible. In 1951, Nelson showed that planetary configurations and sunspots were highly correlated with radio interference on Earth, while Williams established a correlation between electric cable failures, sunspots and planetary positions. Despite these findings, most current literature on solar activity assumes that the planets do not affect it, and conditions internal to the Sun are primarily responsible for the solar cycle. The Sun's 11-year solar cycle is governed by the alignment of the planets, with Venus, Earth and Jupiter's tidal forces influencing the solar magnetic field, scientists have found. The discovery helps explain why the Sun operates on such a regular cycle, something researchers had previously struggled to account for. The Sun goes through solar cycles every 11 years, with activity peaking or charging and waning, discharging, over this period. At the height of activity, the solar maximum, more sunspots tend to appear on the sun's surface. It is also associated with more eruptions, with an increase of solar flares and coronal mass ejections, events that can have an impact on Earth. At the moment we are in the solar minimum part of the cycle, where activity is at a low. In a study published in the journal Solar Physics, researchers from an independent German research institute say they have found evidence showing the role that planets play in the solar cycle. The tidal forces of Venus, Earth and Jupiter produce a gravitational force that can cause changes to the plasma on the surface of the Sun. These forces are at their strongest when there is a maximum alignment of the three planets, an event that takes place once every 11 years. The researchers compared observations of solar activity over the last 1,000 years with the planetary alignment and found that the two are indeed linked. There is an astonishingly high level of concordance, Frank Stefani, lead author of the study, said in the statement. What we see is complete parallelism with the planets over the course of 90 cycles. Everything points to a clocked process. While the forces are too weak to change the goings-on in the Sun's interior directly, the researchers believe there could be an indirect mechanism resulting in the solar cycle planet alignment they observe. They argue that a physical effect that can change the behaviour of a liquid or plasma, known as the Taylor instability, could be responsible. The Taylor instability can react to small changes to tidal forces, with a small shift creating perturbations on the Sun. Using computer models and simulations, the researchers found the momentum from the alignment from the three planets was enough to cause the changes observed. This means the planets, although through an indirect mechanism, may appear to be setting the Sun's solar cycles, the team concluded. As you heard from the independent scientists, they all seem to correlate with the science and explanations of the Walter Russell cosmology. From this Walter Russell illustration, he suggests that the sun charges the planets, which could be what is causing the sunspots. Also, from this Walter Russell illustration, it occurred to me that the moon, when it is in its waxing or in the charging phase, could it be being charged from the sun, as it is being more and more illuminated, and when the moon is in its waning or discharging phase, it could possibly be radiating its energy back to the sun. But that is just my theory. Something else people will find interesting, and that I have noticed whilst filming the luminaries, and that people may be unaware of. Each luminary has its own unique cymatic signature. 
And if we go on the evidence we see, we see that the waveforms that we associate with each luminary or star halo node, some are using short wave and some are using long wave, which would probably be to regulate the speed of what they use to cross from east to west. Each waveform is also associated with a colour from the light spectrum, which relates to the workings of Walter Russell. Because what Walter was showing us, each octave has its own frequency in the colour spectrum and probably has sound too. There have also been many other studies on how the sunspot cycle may affect our human bodies. And much research has been done over the last three centuries, which can confirm that influenza pandemics tended to occur during peaks of solar magnetic activity, which is at the height of the 11-year solar cycle. And the cases of the flu fell and rose with the number of sunspots. Many other researchers between the years 1799 and the present day have also connected influenza with sunspots and or atmospheric electricity. In the years 1645 to 1715, in the Maunder Minimum period, when there was virtually no sunspots, there was no worldwide pandemics of flu. In 1715, the sunspots reappeared, and between then and 1727, the sunspot numbers gradually grew to over a hundred for the first time in over a century. In 1728, influenza arrived back over our realm, and we again had a flu pandemic for the first time in over 150 years, and it became more violent between the years 1733 and 1738, which was the peak of the next solar cycle. Not only is there a correlation between sunspots and influenza, but there is also a correlation between illnesses and the introduction of electricity to our realm. The extent to which geomagnetic and electromagnetic fields and waves affect biological organisms has grown into an increasingly important field of study over the last century. Beginning during the Industrial Revolution, humans increasingly generated artificial electric fields resulting from developments in industry and especially radar communication technology, power lines from the electrical grid, transport and a plethora of consumer electronics. This substantially enhanced the scale and complexity of the electromagnetic environment. In effect, whether naturally or technically generated, variable electrical currents are a substantial source of electromagnetic radiation in the atmosphere. For example, all manners of radio communication, ranging from older radio location, radio navigation and portable telephones to the wireless communication network in the higher range of frequencies which are widely used in domestic, medical and industrial appliances. We live in a vast electromagnetic soup which has an adverse effect on DNA and cell membrane integrity and viability as well as immune and neuronal functioning. A large rapid qualitative change in the Earth's electromagnetic environment has occurred six times in history. In 1889, power line harmonic radiation began. From that year forward, the Earth's magnetic field bore the imprint of power line frequencies and their harmonics. In that year exactly, the natural magnetic activity of the Earth began to be suppressed. This has affected all life on Earth. The power line age was ushered in by the 1889 pandemic of influenza. In 1918, the radio era began. It began with the building of hundreds of powerful radio stations at low frequency and very low frequencies. The frequencies guaranteed to most alter the magnetosphere. The radio era was ushered in by the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918. In 1957, the radar era began. It began with the building of hundreds of powerful early warning radar stations that littered the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, hurling millions of watts of microwave energy skyward. Low frequency components of those waves rode on magnetic field lines to the Southern Hemisphere, polluting it as well. The radar era was ushered in by the Asian flu pandemic in 1957. In 1968, the satellite era began. It began with the launch of dozens of satellites whose broadcast power was relatively weak, but since they were already in the magnetosphere, they had as big an effect on it as a small amount of radiation that managed to enter it from sources on the ground. The satellite era was ushered in by the Hong Kong flu pandemic in 1968. The first commercial 3G network was launched in June 2003, which was closely followed with the onset of the SARS pandemic, 
and the 4G switch on correlates with the swine flu outbreaks during 2009, and we can only imagine what happened to the Earth's natural human resonance when SpaceX launched 60 satellites in Earth's lower atmosphere in May 2019, and a further 720 later that year, and more and more are being added all the time. The effect from these may not be known for many years to come. We are all a part of a living Earth, as the Earth is a member of a living solar system and a living universe. The play of electricity across the magnetic rhythms of this planet, the 11-year sunspot cycle, the fluctuations in the solar wind, thunder and lightning, upon this earth, biological currents within our bodies, the one depends upon all the others. We are like the tiny cells in the body of the universe. Events on the other side of our galaxy affect life here on earth. And it is perhaps not too far-fetched to say that any dramatic change in life on Earth will have a small but noticeable effect on the Sun and the stars. Ley lines, which are another electromagnetic grid of our Earth, every race and culture in our realm has known about these lines for thousands of years. Yet everyone had different names for them. We only have to look back at ancient cultures and see that the native Indians, for instance, used to call ley lines spirit lines, and their shamans used to use the electromagnetic energy in these lines to help them contact the spirits. They even designed their medicine wheel on the spirit lines. And throughout history, all megalithic structures have been strategically built on top of the ley lines. From the pyramids of Giza to Stonehenge, Notre Dame, Parthenon, the Vatican, the DC capital, Mecca, Aztec pyramids, the Bermuda Triangle, Coral Castle, even Tessa's lab in Shoreham, New York, including all nuclear power plants, military bases and stadiums, which are also used to harness energies, like giant batteries. Much of the grid where two or many ley lines intersect are marked with obelisks, such as the Washington DC monument, Vatican courtyard and Cleopatra's needle in Central Park. These electromagnetic lines of the Earth are the veins and receive its energies from the Sun that connects and affects every living organism on Earth. And of course there are also dark forces as well that are and were knowledgeable of these ley lines such as secret societies and Hitler who was very much into the esoteric realms and worked very closely with Maria Orsic who was a famous medium who later became the leader of the Vril Society. It is also very interesting that the Swiss Lab CERN and the Brookhaven Lab in New York both sit on ley lines, and both of these labs have a Hadron Collider that directly impact these ley lines, negatively and or positively. You can't physically see ley lines, but you can detect them by dousing for them. What is also interesting to note is that it is said that where the ley lines intersect and meet, they also align perfectly with astrological constellations. If you plot these and other sites on a map, a curious thing becomes apparent. Many of them can be connected by straight lines. As I said before, ley lines start and end at prominent features and landmarks, like star forts, obelisks, churches or stone circles, and they are the nodes or terminal points of our realm's particle accelerators. Intersecting ley lines create vortexes or spirals of energy, just like a chakra. Leyline researcher David Cowan theorised that these spirals or vortexes are either negative black spirals or positive white spirals, much like the yin and yang energy. It is believed that these vortexes are capable of healing and aligning with our energy, as well as Mother Earth. Many people use them to meditate, hold rituals and engage with this energy directly. Salantra King tells us that the cause of a negative area can be from many different imbalances. Perhaps a negative ley line or crossing of lines could be created or made by collective negative thought patterns of the people in the environment. Like Walter Russell said, every thought and action of anyone affects everyone. In order to create harmony, we need to achieve free-flowing positive energy grids and vortexes. It does seem that there is a focused effort to affect and manipulate the Earth's electromagnetic fields using these technologies. By controlling and influencing the geoelectrical grid, they can affect the Earth and also indirectly or directly can control our thoughts and emotions artificially because we are all connected with Mother Earth. It does seem very likely that we all once knew the power of our Earth's electromagnetic grid and were able to use it 
but because our accustomed technocratic elite play their favourite tunes on their radio station doesn't mean we have to always dance to that tune. We can change the channel and learn how to use the electromagnetic grid to play a more harmonic tune. Maybe they need a machine because it is only a handful of technocrats attempting to control the masses. When enough are awake and aware that their machine is no match for all of our combined power. Love and empathy for humanity is key, and right now we are all still lacking in this, due to the lack of true knowledge. Instead, we are all quick to step on each other's toes to get to where we think we need to be in business, our personal lives, and even within the spiritual communities. It may sound like a sci-fi movie to you, but these energy points all exist, and even more so, these technocratic elite make all their decisions and agendas based on this celestial and terrestrial knowledge. At this point in time, we don't even know who we are, where we are, what we are, or why we're even here. I believe that if more are aware of this natural phenomenon, break our mental bonds to the material matrix, and take action on these ley lines, which can be found all over our realm, then we can take back what is rightfully ours and positively manifest paradise on earth as the true empathetic intellectual light beings we were intended to be and not the slaves we are today i hope you enjoyed that thank you for watching